All right. Okay, I think we're going to get started. So thank you so much to everybody for coming to the European Customer Centricity Awards webinar, which today's topic is best practices for design defining customer insights. My name is Mark Hamill. I'm the CEO of Arquette Global. And just to give you some insight about what the awards are all about, um, this is a fantastic platform for getting recognition for companies. Uh, everyone that's involved today has been either a winner and or judge uh, at the awards in the past. So they've got terrific insight and understanding about what the awards are all about as well. For those of you interested, we have the entry registration deadline on the 6th of May. Um, and for any com companies that are participating, you would have up until the end of May to fill in any entry forms. Um, so plenty of time, really, as long as the, you get in before the, the 6th of May, with the events taking place on the 15th and 16th of September. Quick run through of the agenda. I'll introduce our fantastic panel of speakers today which they will then provide some opening statements on the topic. We'll have some questions and answers with the panelists, and then I'll open it up to the floor for each of you to, who wishes to ask a question to turn on your camera and ask the questions directly, or alternatively, if you have any questions throughout, please just fill it in on the chat and we'll get to it when the, the Q&A session begins. Just a bit of housekeeping, uh, whilst the the introductions and opening statements and um, Q&A with panelists is going on. Please keep yourself on mute until we open up the floor around about uh, 9 a.m. Central European time. And as I said, please feel free to put questions in the chat throughout. So as I mentioned, we also have a fantastic uh, panelist, set of panelists today. Uh, we have Jeff Sheehan, who's the Managing Director of CXJS Consulting. Judith Steinman, who's the v Vice President of Marketing for Guru, and Alex de Groot, who's a CX procurement specialist. So I'm going to turn off the uh, presentation now, sharing screen, and I'll pass you over to Jeff to introduce yourself. Hey, good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for making the time to join us. It's great to see so many faces so early and so many familiar faces. Everybody looks great, by the way. I feel, I feel like I got up too early. <laughs> hey, Gregorio, Claire. Um, Jim, I see Jim's uh, uh, cartoon there. Um, so uh, I'm Jeff Sheehan, I'm a CX uh, consultant, independent CX consultant here in Dublin, Ireland, uh, from the States originally, and um, due to head back to the States as well. But I was a judge last year with Arcit uh, Global's uh, European Customer Centricity Awards. Fortunate to be a judge this year, and um, just happy to be here and looking forward to uh, a, 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 a great discussion. Thank you very much, Jeff. And Jutta, over to you. Yes, hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Mark, for inviting me to be here on the on this panel session. My name is uh, Jutta Schlien, and I'm the VP Marketing at Guru. Uh, Guru is a young startup, so probably just wants to introduce quickly what we do so uh, you understand. Um, so we have developed a CX platform that allows companies to involve their own brand community members to help support seeking customers in real time via live chat instantly and around the clock. Uh, we have like a, an AI based smart routing engine running behind that recognizes the incoming inquiries and routes them to the best suited brand advocates to answer on a first come first serve basis a bit with what you may know from uh, Uber. And the goal really is to deliver customers a great customer experience whenever they need it and wherever they are on the web page and this in a cost effective way. And uh, we have um, submitted our um, case um, for the award uh, two years ago. Um, and this is how I got to know Mark. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Judith. And Alex, over to you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me for this seminar. Um, also, thanks for uh, inviting me for, as a judge uh, for, uh, let's say, the coming events. Um, uh, for people that don't know me yet, I'm, I guide business leaders in their strategy and programs uh, from ideation to execution in the area of CX, DX, uh, D2C, marketing and procurement to really drive uh, partnerships from the very first start all the way to the end 
and actually maintain it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alex. So, uh, as uh, I said, it's now time to get started with your opening statements on the topic. So, best practices for defining customer insights. Jeff, would you have some opening remarks on this? Yeah, I think, um, so it's my sort of consultant brain, but I think uh, metrics and the best metrics to use are very contextual for the business that you're in. Um, and I also think that metrics tend to uh, skew towards internally focused measurements. So, um, you know, we look at all kinds of KPIs about how our operation is running and we sort of forget that none of that is meaningful to a customer. And as customers ourselves, you know, we don't really care what the average call handling time is. We care that we've waited 22 minutes for someone to pick up the phone to speak to us. So um, what, I, uh, what I always try to entertain and, and bring into the discussion is something called a customer performance indicator, something that measures a metric that, that uh, uh, captures what, something that's important to the customer. So um, you know, some examples, for example, uh, it might be a first visit resolution or a first call resolution, um, on-time arrival, on-time departure, um, failure rates. So if I'm buying a, you know, a device of some kind and it breaks, you know, maybe never it, or, or maybe it breaks too often. Um, but those kind of metrics where you can really look at the business and what the offerings are and understand what is a meaningful metric, something measurable that's meaningful to the customer and incorporate that into um, your, I'll say, stack of, of, uh, of KPIs and other indicators. Um, that's, that's what I, I'm a big proponent of making sure that the customer's voice is also included in your metrics. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jeff. And Jutta? Um, yeah, I can only underline what Jeff uh, said. I think to have um, the customer voice and uh, um, available and actually allow the customer to, to, to kind of input. But I think the challenge as well is how do you get this input from customers? Because um, nowadays, uh, I mean, it, you know, the, it, we mainly get those information online. Um, this is the, the interaction that, uh, that, that is predominant um, to gather information and it's, it's, it's very, uh, it is all very fast how a customer interacts with a, with a company and uh, how can we have customers provide feedback without them feeling annoyed that they need to maybe submit data, submit information. Um, and I think it's it's important also to find metrics that makes it easy to a customer um, to submit um, his voice, but then also that he feels heard. I mean, there is no point in collecting um, information if if then you know nothing is really done in a way that the customer sees you know that his his opinion is taken into consideration. So excellent, Judith. Thank you very much, and Alex. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, I agree with, with Jeff and Jutta. Um, but I think, let's say, it, it, it is all about, let's say, the, the people internally that make the difference. Um, where, regardless of matrix, uh, if people are being targeted on, then uh, before you know it, people start to make the difference in uh, um, modifying numbers because it's usually manually. So you need to make sure that stuff is automated, that uh, they cannot pick the list of the customers. It's those things that you need to think about on, on one hand. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, you should make sure that people uh, have the opportunity to do best. Uh, but I do believe in a certain level of control. And what I see in big companies, you know, the large corporates, they all stick to their own plan. They stick to their own KPIs. Um, uh, while the patient is dying in the operation room. And uh, I see that too often, uh, that everyone does their at most best, but they don't speak uh, the same language. So it's important to also break down any barriers between departments to make sure we're all heavily focused on the customer. 
And I think uh, one of the examples I came across in um, over the years was there was one guy actually putting a sign says, this is the voice of the customer. It's his chair. Now speak to him. What will you do for him and or her? Huh? And uh, I think that is important just to show every meeting, you know, how we're going to do well for this person. And I think it is important to, uh, uh, to address and think, you know, I come from a procurement background the, the last eight years. And I think uh, it is important to, to show while we are heavily focused on savings, payment terms, those kind of things, it does not address uh, what the customer needs. So maybe it needs a fast turnaround time on the project so things can go live, so clients are helped. This may not be my direct KPI, but it does make sure that there is revenue and customers, right? So I think that's, um, you know, from my point of view, my two cents. So yeah, thanks, Alex. And I would say that has to be one of the best quotes I've heard, focusing on metrics whilst the patient is dying in the waiting room. I think that's one that we can <laughs> all, all relate to when it comes to these metrics. And I'll, I'll stick with you, Alex, for this, this question. That, so how do you establish the best metrics to use? Does it depend on type of organization size? You mentioned about breaking down those departmental silos. So what would you suggest in, in your experience where it's been successful? Uh, in order to set things up, I think, uh, first of all, yeah. you need to standardize stuff. You need to make sure that uh, uh, everyone is talking the same language. You need to make sure that the, the, the data becomes information. The information becomes, uh, you know, insights. Um, and what I then usually see uh, in the various departments, while I, as a procurement guy, I work with the marketing team, the e-commerce team, and so on, is once they, first of all, they find it hard to collect the data, then they, they have all kinds of dashboards, and then they distribute it to the globe. Okay, and that's nice. And those guys, they hardly don't have any time because they're not a specialist. So they have no clue what to, or uh, partially a clue, let me say positive, on what they're supposed to do, uh, how to interpret the information and what kind of actions. Let alone, will they actually have time? Because we all push everything towards the MPE, like in the, at the end of the month, the, the NPS form, uh, the sales uh, uh, targets to, to make sure everything is being reported on. So while there's little time, we give them a bunch of work, we give them half uh, uh, raw material, and we say, you can do this. Uh, so it, let's say, I've seen it in, in my last company uh, so often that we collect data, it, at best we make a dashboard out of it, and then you're on your own, good luck. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a bit of, a, let's say, uh, you really need to make sure that those in that there are insights created that becomes trackable and you move on uh, in sense, okay, best practices across the globe, uh, make sure that there is a, a really a culture uh, that drives that CX. So it needs to be, become a culture uh, thing. No? Excellent. Thank you, Alex. And Jutta or Jeff, Jeff, any anything uh, to add to that? Um, from my perspective, I think there is, um, and it, it underlines also a bit what, what Alex just said, but there, I think there is an overwhelming amount of tools, you know, to measure um, customer insights. And I think it already starts to, to carefully um, define what do you want to measure and at, what, at which stage do you want to me measure it? So, what I kind of like um, uh, thinking about right now, uh, also from, from our perspective at Guru, you know, is to, to really define, and also in regards to what we offer to our customers, is really to make sure that we are aware of the customer journey. And I think to really carefully mapping the customer journey to understand all the different phases a customer goes through, I think that's a good starting point to to define where do you want to gain insights and how do you want to gain the insights at this particular moment. And then you need to choose which tool do you, do you want because it's quite easy to use all those fancy tools that come along with all the, the tools that you anyway already have in use, you know, all the, in the CRM system or Google and so on. 
um, and then you collect a lot of data, but actually it's kind of disconnected with the context. So I think it's important that you really define this strategy. And I also think it's important that the, the different departments work together so that they, that at the end of the day, what you want to have is like this one big light, you know, that, that, that uh, is on, on your business and that collects data. And maybe just one more comment, um, what, what Alexander said, which I also strongly agree with is it, it really depends um, how big is your company and, you know, are you B2B, are you B2C? I mean, these are all um, factors to take into consideration to find out what do you want to gain. Absolutely, yeah. Jeff? I, I, would, just, I would just add one, you know, small example to illustrate everything that, that Alex and, and Jutta have, have, have just uh, said, which is, you know, I did a study with a, with a client and it's a, um, a car rental, holiday car rental uh, agency, and they have a mobile app that's really, you know, sophisticated and works quite well. Uh, and at the end of the trans, and, and I used the app in, as part of a, my research, and I booked a car and then I immediately was presented with a survey. Now this is on my phone, so it's a small screen and it was three three little you know cartoon faces was it you know good uh, red yellow green basically um they asked two questions in their survey just for booking a car now mind you the journey of renting a car is you book it you go and pick it up you work you, you interact with somebody at the place where you pick up the car you might not have they might not have the car that you booked because you know it's it's holiday season so they want to upgrade you or downgrade you um, the car might be smelly, might smell like a smoker, might smell, you know, it might be dirty, it might, you know, because they didn't have time to clean it from when it was returned a few minutes ago. There's a whole experience around getting a car, but when they, when they booked on the mobile app, they asked me, how easy was it to book your car? A customer effort kind of question. Then they asked me if I would recommend uh, this company to friends and family. And I just thought, that's a really inappropriate question at this point in the journey to ask me. And when, as we all know, you know, when you sort of pull that thread and you realize that's a lot of data that's being captured and not acted on, that's a lot of, um, you know, storage or networking or, you know, there's, there's a lot of something that that generates, but it's irrelevant to a customer uh, journey at that point. Um, so it just has a small example of, you know, what you measure, thinking it through, how are you going to use it if you're asking me for my feedback does it ever come back does it ever circle back to um hey we listened to you and and here's what we did for you customers so um yeah it, it's just one of those instances of um maybe just using the default settings in one of the tools that they use uh, but i just found it to be it, there wasn't a lot of thought apparently to you know how the how that process was set up and so that was the, the nature of the engagement. But again, just a, a small example of how we get to be really mindful about what you measure, where you measure it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That just reminds me of a, a there's, there was a tourist attraction in Dubai and it was like a four hour long excursion. And within the last 15 minutes, when it was already dark, they handed every guest a 30 question paper questionnaire just before you were about to leave. And I was just thinking, this well just ruins your experience at the end but also there's no way people are going to be honest or even fill it in and um, so it reminds me a little bit of that Jeff and actually sticking with you the question we have here is based on one of your inputs there in the example people have been saying that NPS is dead a lot of people have been saying the opposite what do you believe is the case or maybe you're somewhere in between yeah so it's a great question I don't think NPS is dead I think NPS um, I, th I think CX was largely a few years ago, maybe five, six years ago, um, was built around this idea that um, surveys and scores were a fundamental defining characteristic of what a customer experience management program is. And then um, it became, uh, I've seen job descriptions where the, the CX leadership role that's being um, staffed is basically to move an NPS score from one number to another number. I mean, I've, se I've seen just how ridiculously overemphasized NPS has become. 
And it's also underscored by the guy, uh, a man named Fred Reichelt. Fred uh, invented NPS and he's just released a new book and he's doing interviews for his new book and he's talking to people about how NPS has been so distorted. It's not used appropriately anymore. And and that's from Fred Reichelt, the inventor of NPS. So I agree. I think NPS has been overemphasized and overfocused. And I think uh, Alex made a, a comment earlier that you know NPS is one of those things that shows up on a dashboard, but it never answers the question for business people in the business units. So what? So my NPS is this number. What does that mean? How does that translate to revenue or cost or uh, customer advocacy and th those kind of things? It doesn't really answer those things. It's a great sort of barometer. Maybe you know which direction is the wind coming from? Are we doing okay? Are we? Are we? Could we? You know, are we? Are we handling a COVID uh, you know situation? Uh, well or not, I think from a big picture perspective, NPS is very useful. Um, but for the kind of tactical customer experience of kind of making, you know, deliberate changes and very specific decisions to fix things or improve things, um, I, I don't see NPS as being a key driver for that. Interesting. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Jeff. And Jutta, do you have any take on that? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, maybe more from the from the view of us as a uh, you know as a as a provider. I mean, we use um, the NPS scoring um, question at the end of each chat interaction between um, a, a, a customer and a, a brand advocate. So at the end, we ask you know how likely would you recommend that service, and it's actually really. Um, uh, used frequently. I mean, it's not uh, mandatory, of course. I mean, uh, consumers can decide whether yes or no they want, want to leave a, um, a, um, a result. And now the question obviously is what does the company do with that information? But for us, for instance, it's super um, helpful if I look, if I just look from our perspective, because we can really see uh, patterns, you know. Um, you know, for like this, the way our solution works is that um, you you have a question and this uh, AI engine um, identifies the question and sends it to the best source of knowledge, ideally to, the, to a brand community member. But it can also go to, a, to an agent if it's like a, a question that needs to be answered by an agent or to the bot if it can be um, answered automatically. What we see now is we can also see depending on, on how the NPS um, moves, you know, was it a good answer provided by the source of knowledge? And if there is a fallback because the community member can maybe not answer or the question goes in a direction where it needs, needs to go to an agent and then we see how the NPS moves. This is a good indication to see what does a customer expect, you know, in, in regards to getting his question answered if it's by a community member if it's an automated standardized answer or if it is resolved by an agent excellent thank you Jitta and alex don't know if i can unmute for you you myself from my side Okay. Um, there we go. I, I don't think I have uh, uh, anything to add. I think I've heard, uh, let's say, the stuff uh, that I, I would have mentioned. Excellent. Thank you. And um, well, this again goes a bit back to what Jeff's story was as well. So, when is the best time to ask for customers' feedback? So, and, and due to your mention about the, the customer journey and understanding that first, that feeds into it as well. So, who would like to answer this question? I will be happy to. I think okay. it, uh, it it starts with uh, before, during, and after the customer journey. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it starts with the branding, right? Uh, understanding, you know, just the preference. And each part of the journey, each interaction with the client, you need to, you know, collect data, whether it's online, whether it's physical, in a store, uh, anywhere, uh, you need to pick your data and uh, make sure that uh, you standardize this across the globe or the country or your, your chain and make sure that that becomes insights and actionable and that you track those actions and that you make sure that being communicated across the globe uh, or your company to make sure that uh, everyone can benefit from it. 
so it, it's every interaction with the client, whether it's a bill, whether it's a complaint, whether let's say it's a, it's a website. Um, everywhere you need to collect your data. And, uh, you know, in the age of uh, e-commerce, uh, uh, obviously online a lot get tracked. Uh, so that is being handled way better uh, nowadays. But uh, I think on the, on, the, on the customer care part, uh, you know, uh, I think there's still an awful lot to gain. Uh, know your customers, know what your install base, base is, um, what they might be calling for, etc. Jutta? Yeah, I think I said it already earlier on, you know, that I think across the entire customer journey, it's, it's um, important to, to collect data <clears throat> points. Um, so it, it, there, you should not just focus on one single um, interact or yeah interaction point uh, most of the time i think or the, the the one that is really suited to do so is a uh, customer service right to to collect the data there but i think there are some anywhere where the customer interacts there is data to collect and as i said earlier it's important that you define what what insights do you want to gain and what insights that you gain are you actually also able to modify depending on, on, on what the outcome you, you gather. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, so just on that, just reminding me of an example, Jeff, just before I pass over to you, but there is a, a, a workshop that we ran a few years ago. I won't name the, the country even, um, but it was a bank and they only measure, asked uh, customer satisfaction question, related questions to people that had got a loan. They didn't ask people that didn't get it. So their satisfaction rates were completely skewed. And uh, so the, the examples that, so they wouldn't, they would only do it for ones where they felt there was a happy outcome, which is an even more tricky uh, way of looking at it. But Jeff, just thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, there, there's so many examples of, um, um, I would say design, flaws where we, we, if we focus on surveys and scores and we attach incentives to those things, we start to see some, some strange behavior. It, it isn't logical or rational, or it certainly isn't designed to be honest with ourselves. Um, but I think in terms of the best time to ask customers for feedback, I think that's a great question to work out in your journey mapping and do it by an offering. So for, you mentioned, uh, Mark, the, the, the mortgage. The mortgage journey in Ireland, for example, can begin online with an, an approvement, a, a approval in principle, an AIP, or in America, we call it the, the you're pre-approved. You have a letter from the bank saying you can borrow, you're, you're already pre-approved to borrow X, X amount of money. And then you go shopping for a house, then you find your house, and then you go back to the bank to say, here's the house that I want, here's the offer that I made, here's how much money I need to borrow. And um, and that might be a face-to-face -face, uh, encounter. And between the AIP that you get online and you know the actual sit down with a, with a mortgage uh, person, there could be a number of phone calls back and forth, um, a number of documents exchanged and so forth. So as you lay out your journey for whatever the offering is or whatever the experience is, um, that's that's where you have to ask yourself what what do we want to know what how do we ask it um, what are we going to do with it how do we acknowledge it and how does it end up in this sort of um, uh, I love what, uh, what 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 Alex said how do we go take it from data to in information to insight to an action you know what's that sort of process um, I think I think journey mapping can help people really clarify the answer to the question of what to measure, when to measure, how to measure, whether it's a transactional thing or a relationship thing, whether it's a customer effort or customer satisfaction or customer advocacy, which NPS uh, is a, a, a form of. So um, I would see journey mapping as a big uh, exercise to answer those questions. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. And we're going to have one more question at the panel before we open it up to the floor. Uh, so if there's any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them in the next five minutes or so. 
Uh, so the final question is, why do you think companies still struggle in turning this information and insights into action? But what is what are the major challenges there? Um, Who's, shall, go ahead, I Alex. That? Shall I answer that? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, let's say, it's a combination. Um, it's a combination of that they understand that flow, what we just talked about, data, insights, action, etc. cetera. Um, it's about budgets. You know, central teams uh, make data available and, uh, and a dashboard, but then you're on your own. Um, and the guys that uh, make it are the experts, but the ones that use it, you know, they, um, they are a part-timer usually, meaning they have tons of other stuff to do. So it's about making sure that the, the people have time for it and that you guide them, you train them, and that you nurture a culture that drives CX. I think that's, uh, so you need to think about what, what are the obstacles all the employees uh, that would love to do something about CX, how to take the bottlenecks away from them, just to spend time on it and do the right thing, instead of let's make sure that the action list of the manager is, uh, is done, instead of uh, what is important to the customer. And uh, you know, be, be rational about, is this good for the company or am I just making sure that I'm reaching my KPIs because I'm being targeted upon? And I think it's, uh, it's those people that are a bit blunt and a bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, a bit a, a portion of a, a devil's uh, advocate just to make sure that you, you, you get and, and make, make changes instead of, let's say, follow the leader. Um, you need to have a rebel in your team to just make sure that, you know, it's not, it's, you know, you really need to make change, right? Yeah. Uh, I think, it, so it's, for me, it's all about the people. Uh, so uh, an MPS on MPS is equally important. Uh, and just take out what are the obstacles to, to perform better. And what, regardless of the number, um, I once was in a position where the discussion was, uh, shall we move from phone interviews to online interviews? No, we cannot do that, Alex. Um, yeah, because why? Well, it's our upper management. They are KPI'd on this. If there's a trend uh, uh, a breach, uh, then uh, um, it's no good for their KPIs and their bonuses. And we're talking about country managers. So you'll have a riot on your hand. I don't want to be involved. Uh, so <laughs> it's those were you the rebel then, Alex? Is, is that what you're trying to say? You were the rebel in your team. That's that's what you're trying <laughs> well, to say. We, we did change it, but a CEO committed to say, yeah. "I will pick up the discussion. Uh, you yeah. will guide them to me." Uh, that the the numbers have significantly changed, whether they're dropped or increased. I don't mm -hmm. care. Uh, this is the right thing because of cost. This is the right thing because of information that is handed to me instantly uh, mm -hmm. instead of six weeks later after the survey. It is about understanding what the actions are and whether actually people are progressing and whether I call my Indonesian country manager or my uh, 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 Argentina country manager, I know what they're supposed to do. I can actually track it. I can see it myself. And uh, then of course it is up to the CEO to decide whether being genuine about the, the the ask or whether this is about you know the yeah. <laughs> bashing a country manager because he apparently is not doing right or he's you know his face is different or whatever right yeah yeah so but you need to create the tools on on that but it it really depends on the people how to do this excellent thank you very much all these good examples there as well so and uh, Jutta uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> my comment here, maybe just in addition, is I think uh, the struggle very much depends um, on, first of all, on, probably on the size of the company. You know, there are certainly different struggles of a, of a smaller company or, or, or a corporate. Mm -hmm. um, corporate, probably that's what Alex uh, just um, pointed out, you know, the struggles that you can have there. But um, if I look 
uh, at us as a startup company, but also at some of our um, clients like in e-commerce, you know, I think there maybe one of the struggles is, um, is really availability. As, uh, as simple as that, you know, having people, because we, we also have to be aware that that the job of of um, collecting data and um, reading data, interpreting data, that that's a, a huge job, right? I mean that de de demands a lot of knowledge and a, a lot of time, and um, and then I think this this is this is one of the struggles that you don't really have people available for that, or that you think they can do it just next to their daily job quickly and we all have all those fancy tools that measure it but I think it's not that that easy and that's why at the beginning I also said you have to carefully choose the tools and then also the metrics what do you want to measure and then one struggle is maybe a very human one you probably don't necessarily want to get insights that you don't want to hear um, and, and th this is important you know to face what is the insight I gain? And does it really now require me to make changes that we don't really want to make? Alexander said, okay, um, in the management, the reason could be because they don't get a bonus. That, that's horrible, right? Um, it can also be that you have to realize that you need to make some fundamental changes in your offering or in the way your e-commerce or whatever works, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think these are kind of struggles as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Jeff, have you got anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I do. Um, I think I think insights, uh, the struggle with turning insights into action, can begin with just not having a clear definition of what an insight is. So, uh, to Yuda's uh, point about having, um, there can be there can be so much data, and you don't know what you're looking for. Literally, it's like going to the ocean to find a shell. Right, so it, it, they're there, but you don't know if, if you've got the right one. You know, there's just so many. So really, defining your insight. You, you are you looking at your business, and this is where your business model and your channels and all the rest of it are are very important considerations. Where, you know, do I want to convert to sales from browsing a website or browsing a catalog to uh, you know a, an actual transaction completed? Do I want to reduce cost? by examining the root cause of my contact center calls. And we're using uh, technology in the, in, the, in the contact center to tag calls and so forth um, so that we can examine, if we, if we have a philosophy that says, well, if they're calling us, it's because there's an upstream problem. The instructions weren't clear. The bill was confusing. There weren't the right parts in the box to, for me to put my furniture together, or, you know, whatever those issues are that people are calling. So really understand what you want, and what an insight is for your organization and be very clear about defining that and it should meet a threshold and in the work that i do we work through that and it sounds kind of crazy but this language that we take for granted and, and insight but when you really examine it and ask people in a room you'll get as many answers as there are people to answer the question so when you're clear about what an insight is then you know what to look for in that data that operational data the experiential data you'll know what the correlations are, you'll know what the thresholds are between the, say the strength of a correlation and, and, it, and it should make it to a list of things to, to really examine. And then you need a, a sort of governance. You need to sort of figure out um, the reality is, uh, as Alex mentioned, there's budget realities, there's capacity realities, there's skill realities. So every insight may not make it to action, but you have to have a deliberate process to sort that out. So. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a very informal process where the loudest complainer gets the resource to fix their thing. And sometimes it's a more disciplined uh, uh, governance of really examining the expected return on an investment to, to, to attack uh, an insight. And so, that, you know, that, that has to be factored in because obviously we, every organization is bounded by, you know, the resource limitations that it has. And then I think the third item uh, that's that's also very immature in a lot of organizations is measuring the impact of the action. So let's say you've got a good definition of an insight, you've got a good governance to prioritize and act on an insight, but are you looking in the rearview mirror to see, did it do the thing that we intended it to do? I, I worked in an organization where we were very fire, fire, fire. We were great at figuring out what the insights were 
putting an action plan, a project in place, and then we execute the project. And as soon as we were done, we'd move on to the next project. We never examined the impact of what we did. And so there's a lot of lessons to learn there from, you know, did we move the needle? Did we, did we address the insight with our action the way we intended to? So that's a very mature and disciplined uh, uh, set of steps. And of course, it's even more complicated when you're in a big organization, but that's, I think, an essential part of evolving your CX program to um, not just listening and learning, but actually doing the things that can improve both the business operation and the customer experience. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. I think that's like a political economic answer, unintended uh, consequences of policy or changes. You know, that's, uh, that's really something that you have, you have to look at because it obviously it could create more problems than it's, it fixes, right? So it's a really good way of looking at it. Thanks for that. And well, we're coming to some of the questions from, from the audience as well. So Jim, who has now left, um, he has said, NPS can help, but often gamed or for firms chase a number of key, number slash key is, is taking to the customer regularly, talking to the customer regularly, and then closing the loop once a client shares a pain points. What do you think? So let me try and, does anyone see that? Can anyone try and, Garner, what the question is. I'm trying to understand that. Sorry. Uh, it can help, but can be gamed. Key is taking the cost, talking to the customer regularly, and then closing the loop once a client shares pain points. What do you think? So, closing the loop. Is there anyone that would like to give some insight on that? Any? Well, I think uh, closing the loop uh, is a, is an important part. You know, once you have made your action. And you have executed and you have measured actually the impact that uh, what Jeff uh, just discussed. And you should also, let's say, inform the client about what you have done with their remarks. Mm -hmm. Whether that, uh, let's say, is a, is a remark uh, and, a, and a question that could not be properly answered quickly. So whether it is a one-to-one uh, -one answer or whether it's a, it's a generic issue. Uh, whether it's a, a short-term change in a process to tweak something and you know a, a bunch of issues get solved or whether it's an IT issue and it's on the roadmap. I think you need to be uh, honest and transparent uh, towards your clients. Uh, and by just returning uh, and answering the question, it's picked up. And just the fact that you say it is picked up and, and not only like, Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. We'll, we'll work on this. But just about saying, okay, we have qualified this as X, Y, Z. And, uh, you know, over time we will come back uh, once we feel that we are in, in full control of, of, the, of the challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and then actually do it. You know, uh, answer once again, saying, remember six months ago, you asked us to. And then, uh, Okay, so they they have been busy all that time with with this, and they they really took it seriously. And thank you for pointing this out. I, mean, I think it is important because yeah. it changes the mindset. And the next time when they're on the birthday party, they will not talk negative as a detractor, but they will talk positive, saying these guys actually do something with my with your feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think so, it's important. Yeah, yeah. And then if there is something wrong again they'll, they'll be very forthcoming with with information yeah, but it, it changed the mindset in, yeah. in, in, in let's say that the, the gossip at a birthday party uh, yeah. actually uh, is spread in a positive sense instead of a negative sense mm -hmm. uh, so you know you, you get your your you, you change your detractors into promoters absolutely yeah uh, jeff or judith you got anything to add to that yeah, I, I would like to add one thing, and, and it, you know, everyone in this audience is in customer experience management in some way, right? Um, so one of the things I, I'd encourage everyone to do, at, assuming everyone is using a mobile phone and gets app updates, look at your app, uh, mobile app updates, and you'll see a really cool opportunity, oftentimes a missed opportunity, to communicate with customers on the closed loop feedback. So. Uh, I did this recently and I wrote a post about it on LinkedIn, but it's very interesting to see how 
some organizations with their mobile app updates tell you, hey, we listened to what you said and we've made the next set of changes and this, this, this update includes all the things you asked us to do for you. And it's very clear that the customer was listened to and, and that information was, that feedback was acted on. And then there's other apps that um, say, um, oh, you know, it's just a, a routine update. There's, you know, not, you don't, you don't get much information. It's just business as usual. And then there's another set of uh, uh, updates you'll see where they're just score begging. Go to the store, go to the app store and give us a five and you know, give us a great review. They don't tell you that they did anything for the customer, that this, this update is uh, you know, a, a, a customer driven, includes customer driven changes. They just ask for you know, the, the rating and review um, to be a five. So, it, you know, it's just something we can all do and look at that and say, well, there's an opportunity to close the loop with the customer. How are some businesses doing it? And you'll see with your own eyes, you know, how each of these app updates addresses an opportunity to tell customers, we heard you and we incorporated what you wanted into this change. And, and here it is, you know, you're getting it now. So I think that's one of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small part, but it, it's part of the bigger picture of closing the loop with customers mm -hmm. on, um, on, on responding to their feedback. Excellent, thanks, Jeff. Jitta? I, I don't really have any, any much more to, to add, but what just spontaneously comes to my mind now uh, when, when listening to you is um, one thing that, that we observe um, often, you know, is that um, companies make it quite difficult for their customers to get in touch but then they have, they feel completely comfortable in sending out questionnaires or, you know, surveys or whatsoever to gather feedback, but that the customer can proactively reach out to, to give a feedback that they try to hide because, uh, yeah, for obvious reasons that we don't need to discuss now. But I mean, this is a, a bit what, what we try to say, you know, let your customers have super easy access to interact with you. Mm -hmm. Because that is, and, and this is what, what, what Alex said, then you go to a birthday party and you talk kindly about, about your experience, even though maybe it was not super satisfactory, maybe the product didn't really suit you or, or the service wasn't really what you expected, but you were able to get in touch and you were able to have this exchange. Mm -hmm. um, and then simply also having, if you allow a, an exchange and then looking into this exchange, you know, the conversation itself, you can gather a, a lot of, of insights and th that you can use. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think, think we, we've all experienced that, haven't we? Over to you, Alex. Sorry. Yeah, I think, let's say on, on, the, on the last one, uh, I think it is, you know, when, when you, it's actually an opportunity to, you know, make a new interaction and, and guide to new products or new services. So by just pushing them towards a, a website, fill in your complaint and really hard to find how to actually make the complaint or how to file it, um, you're missing the opportunity for great customer experience and for the next sale. Um, so let's say usually uh, customer care organizations are being seen as a cost center. Um, and I can tell from my finance and my procurement perspective. And uh, they're not measured on, you know, what they contribute to revenue. So making the change from a cost center to a profit center, meaning contributing to revenue uh, is, is a key. Uh, and uh, I've had experiences where, let's say, uh, we, we were able to sell lighting as a service in, in certain area, in certain geographics like a barrier. And by just uh, adjusting the, the 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 flow, we were able to to gain a lot of uh, let's say extra service contracts, uh, which showed the Iberia country manager to actually you know proceed and spread the word towards the other uh, country managers. Um, I think it is it's important to 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 see it as an, a new opportunity. And while I understand that uh, let's say young people have different methods of communicating 
looking at my own kids, I'm 50, uh, and uh, you know they don't call, uh, <laughs> and text is very very brief. You <laughs> sometimes you don't even get the question, so to say. Uh, so every type of customer has a different way of communicating, and you need to adapt accordingly. Um, and of course, there is an element of cost related to a certain type of organization. But I think there's opportunities to to mix it. You know that's why there's only channels and so on. Um, it 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 can be done technology uh, wise, and it's important to to guide those thoughts. So people that are usually making the phone call because they think they have a quicker answer, guide them in their their, their way of communicating, uh, so that the next time they will go for a different flow. That may be easier because uh, you know I see Arash asking questions about about uh, you know the feeling of the emotion of the customer. I think uh, um, nowadays there are actually tools that can measure the emotion in a conversation, uh, regardless of language. So how cool is that? That while you're not a native on that certain language, you can start to sense the emotion. And you could write via chat uh, back in, in in their respective language, just by grabbing the you know the emotion detector, so to say. Absolutely. So, so and, technology uh, makes a lot of things possible, but you know you need to invest in it, and you need to spend the time on finding the right tools, making sure that you adjust those flows. And, and just on, on top of that, Alex, as well going back to Rash's question. Um, is that the job of, of the, the frontliners or the, the team leaders or anyone in the organization to have that skill to, to really bring those stories to life as well so that people really understand like, I think and convince it's, people? It's, it's, that it's, it's an element of, let's say, the, the strategic subject matter experts that guide the community saying, okay, there are new tools and things that we should uh, adapt to and uh, get, first of all, get the right partner uh, for this, because usually the, there's IT involved in that. Um, and then start to uh, take a, uh, a, a small team of, you know, a big country and a small country uh, or various departments to see, okay, how we can we modify this flow now? You know, mm -hmm. it's a cool feature. How can we, you know, add this to it? Very good. And or Jeff, have you got any any insight on that? Storytelling, customer stories, how you can get that message across? Um, yeah, I would say that storytelling is a is an undervalued skill set, uh, maybe in uh, customer experience management. That um, there's a skill set around data and data storytelling that I think is I think we'll see it emerge and evolve. Because that is, you know, so important. If you're going to compel, so often CX leaders have responsibility, but they don't have the authority to make the change. They have to work through others, and those others could be business unit leaders, country leaders, etc. And so, how do you convince someone who is making their KPI, and, and and that KPI is connected to an incentive, like a bonus, and they don't want to change anything because they're they're doing fine, but yet the customer feedback, which is largely in the hands of a, of a CX leader, it suggests that, yeah, while you're in fine internally, as we talked about earlier, that KPIs can be very internally focused, the customer feedback is suggesting or clearly saying, we need to fix something. We don't like something and we're gonna go to a competitor. Or we're gonna not buy from you here or, or there's some consequence to the customer not liking it. So, so, so capturing the data storytelling and putting it in a, in a compelling, um, a business driven reason for a stakeholder to make it to take it seriously you know it, it can connect to revenue it can connect to cost reduction it can connect to employee experience and uh, uh, customer satisfaction i think that's a that whole storytelling skill set will be a huge component of the shift from cx being sort of surveys and scores into really being part of an operational function with a return on investment uh, because those stories will compel, uh, you know, business stakeholder leaders to, um, 
to really act on those insights that, that uh, you're bringing to them. You just can't say you have a score of this or customers are saying that without, that's not enough. And we know that when we, when we have our dashboards and so forth, like there's just not enough compelling reason for me to do anything differently. It needs to be uh, a deeper story. Um, oftentimes those stories can be connected to the brand, the mission, vision, values of the organization and kind of keep everyone aligned to um, staying true to you know what the brand says they, they represent. So, I don't really have anything to add. <clears throat> I mean, I think it's uh, it's it's also somehow a bit of a difficult topic because it you know sharing customer like customer insights and customer stories how you cannot really put a number. Yeah. Right. I mean, it it is a very uh, it, it is a bit of an emotional interpretation there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think. For me, it would be how you can inspire change. Some people will respond better to the stories rather than just the data as well. I think that's, and um, some people respond to both uh, or just data alone. So I think different people respond differently, but uh, certainly for me, I think storytelling is very important uh, for driving change in an organization and having those, we're all customers. And so having those stories that people can relate to is likely to, to lead to change in companies, how I feel. Um, we have sadly run out of time today, so I don't know if anyone has any closing remarks or any final questions. We've got three minutes left. Um, uh, Juto or Alex or Jeff, anything you'd like to say before we sign off? No, no, now is the time. I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining this morning and staying with us and, and asking uh, great questions. I, I really appreciate um, your participation and, and uh, interest in, in the conversation. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. And I think it's always a uh, super interesting and um, valuable, you know, to discuss with, uh, with others that ex are in customer experience, have um, insights, share their insights, even through questions. Um, I think it's a, a topic where you keep opening your mind, you know, and, and you, you keep learning almost on a daily basis. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for, for having me and uh, for having the opportunity to, to share thoughts is always good, as, as, as mentioned. So um, really looking forward to the next session to, um, you know, go on a different su subject or different yeah. questions. Thanks, Alex. And yeah, thank you so much to, to each of you, uh, Judah, Jeff and, and Alex. Brilliant panel discussion today. Everyone that's involved and, and hopefully we see at the next session uh, early next month and also at the, the awards in September as well. So have a great day and I'll share this recording with everyone and, and everyone's LinkedIn so you can reach out directly to, to Judah, Alex and, and Jeff as well. So speak soon. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.